Hello and welcome wrestling fans. Coming quick and fast, the 2002 WWE calendar is still on the way and um, we have a very special pay-per-view for you today. Uh, it took place on the 26th of October 2002 and it is WWE Rebellion which is in the UK. It took place at the Manchester Arena in England of course and uh, it was attended by 13,416 ticket buyers and uh, the main event is Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman versus Edge in a handicap match. You can also find this arena in Smackdown. Here comes the pain. I seem to remember that vividly. It is JR saying we've got a tour coming up to Rebellion and would you like a spot on the card? And then you can choose whether you want to go or not. It's pretty cool. Um, and it also exclusively broadcast in the UK. So, um, yeah, this wasn't your sort of worldwide pay-per-view. It was an exclusive to the UK. And a great promo package to open us up as well, which is, you know, very unusual for UK shows. But, uh, yeah, we're going to go into the main part of the video. And uh, we hope you join us there. In the meantime, click the subscribe button, like the video, join us on social media. And um, we'll see you in, in just a second. So let's get into the main part of the show. And we start off with Stephanie McMahon, the general manager of SmackDown, coming down to the ring to make a very special announcement. It is, of course, SmackDown's first own brand pay-per-view. So she wants to make it something very special. And as part of her negotiations with Eric Bischoff on Raw, she has managed to secure, for one night only, the services of none other than five-time, 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 five-time WCW champion Booker T. And he is going to go against Matt Hardy, um, usually uh, a tag team wrestler. Obviously, they've been split up. Um, this is the era of Matt Hardy version one. I actually really love Matt Hardy version one. Whenever I used to make a character on games... I always used to have that overview where it says Matt facts, Matt really likes English muffins, uh, Matt hates English mustard, that kind of thing. Um, really, really cool character, Matt Hardy, Evolution, um, and it comes full, full tilt. Anyway, um, these two were given actually quite a lot of time to work together. Um, it was a really good match to get, get the crowd going the crowd was loving it very much behind Booker T and very much against Matt Hardy um, but uh, yeah it would be a hard-hitting affair with uh, lots of to and fro um, not many high-flying moves of course Matt Hardy is not quite cruiserweight but he's never been a full high flyer like his brother Jeff anyway and Booker T was has always been a heavyweight so Quite a contrast of styles here. Um, Matt Hardy doing all of his usual hijinks uh, that he would do, trying to distract the referee, uh, trying to get in cheap shots on Booker T. Booker T always had an answer for this. Uh, it seems quite strange that you'd bring in a Raw superstar to smack down and have him go over on Matt Hardy, but obviously I do understand that if the crowd's behind a certain wrestler, then it probably is the better option. Um, so the finish comes with Matt Hardy hitting a twist of fate on Booker T. Booker T barely kicking out at two. Um, and uh, Matt Hardy then like looking to the referee, what's happening? Why have you not counted to the three? Count faster, that kind of thing. And uh, goes for it again. Booker T reverses, gives a stiff kick to the gut and uh, hits the scissor kick on Matt Hardy. 
for the win. Um, so yeah, Book T is your winner in this first match. Can give this one three cheap shots out of five. Uh, really good match. Great opener. Um, and the crowd absolutely loving it. Uh, also, after the match, of course, Booker T gets on the microphone and says, "Is there any wrong reason why I came here?" And you want to tell you what's up? No, that's uh, that's that's boom boom shake the room by Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. But he does say, "Is there any one reason I came here?" And I'm going to give you what you want. A spinner Rooney, of course, with an extra little spin at the end because I think he messed it up. But hey, it's all cool, you know. So we next get Paul Heyman stomping down the corridors of the Manchester Arena looking for Stephanie McMahon. Eventually does find the door marked SmackDown general manager and bursts in unceremoniously. He starts complaining about why Stephanie McMahon would book him in a handicap match with Brock Lesnar uh, as his partner and uh, against Edge because basically... If Paul Heyman gets pinned, Edge wins the championship. And let's face it, Edge is still no match for Brock Lesnar, really, uh, at this point in time. Uh, but he's complaining, $2,500 suit and all that kind of stuff. He hasn't bought his trunks, and like Taz says later on, who wants to see Paul Heyman wearing a pair of trunks? The answer is nobody. Um, so, yeah. He doesn't think it's fair, blah, 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 blah. Stephanie McMahon retorts. She says that it is actually fair. It wasn't fair that you broke Undertaker's hand. It's not fair that Payman's the reason that uh, Undertaker's not at Rebellion. Um, uh, and obviously his, uh, his wife at the time, Sarah, was actually due to give birth, which is obviously the real reason that he wasn't there. But, um, yeah, Paul Heyman gets sent packing with his tail, or his ponytail, between his legs. We go on to the next match. It is a mixed gender tag team match. It is uh, Billy Kidman and the delightful Tory versus John Cena. And a very early John Cena, slightly showing his heelish tendencies here. Um, John Cena and they... Equally delightful, Dawn Marie, who's had a sordid relationship with Al Wilson, who is Tori Wilson's father, of course. Another 2002 great, dare I say great? I don't know, it's not great. Um, storyline from SmackDown to equal the Katie Vick storyline. Anyway, <laughs> um, we get into the... Match, Kidman and John Cena start. John Cena showing uh, his quickness, like I say, his heelish tendencies here. Uh, Billy Kidman also showing his uh, his aptitude in the squared circle. Dawn Marie then blind tags John Cena. And, uh, of course, Tory Wilson then has to come in because it's mixed tag rules. Um... So they start having a fight. They're doing pretty well. Arm drags and, and jump overs and basement drop kicks and stuff like that. They're doing they're doing all right for two valet managers. Of course, they're not given as much time as they were in at No Mercy. But then No Mercy was six days previous. And obviously they've got on a plane since then and flown over to England. Um, so yeah, they start rolling around. The uh, the Kidman tries to come in, separate them. He ends up going for a roll as well. He celebrates with the crowd because 2002, and yeah, he was a lucky bugger. But you know, actually, I've drifted off anyway. Um, so they uh, yeah, uh, Billy Kidman celebrates with the crowd, referee is um, dealing with that and Dawn Marie goes over as if to go and slap him uh, but uh, John Cena comes in gives Tory Wilson a body slap and uh, Cena jumps out and says look I'm holding the tag rope uh, certain referees would be really proud of that and 
yeah, the match continues, but it would finish with uh, Dawn Marie and Tori Wilson having another cat fight, as they would call it, and uh, rolling out of the ring. Uh, at that point, uh, just after um, John Cena was trying to hit a move on Tori, uh, Tori would low blow John Cena with the referee distracted again. So lots of distraction in this match. And uh, yeah, uh, eventually uh, Billy Kidman would come in and uh, get the upper hand on John Cena, hit the uh, shooting star press, well, almost hit the shooting star press. I think John Cena was trying to move, move out of the way, didn't quite, uh, Kidman ended up sort of headbutting John Cena uh, but John Cena was built up even in 2002 so uh, I can't imagine that going any other way apart from John Cena just going meh um, and uh, yeah gets the win um, after the match Tory Wilson puts the lip lock on Billy Kidman Billy Kidman looking rather pleased with himself darn you Billy Kidman um, yeah, it's a difficult one to judge this one. Um, good to see John Cena in his early sort of thugonomic days. Um, certainly, the, in my opinion, the best iteration of John Cena. Um, showing what he can do, actually. Didn't get much chance to uh, wrestle, of course, uh, with the mixed tag rules. But, yeah, uh, and also Billy Kidman on show showing his athleticism and it furthers the storyline. You get the feeling this was shoehorned in. Furthers the storyline between Al Wilson, Tori Wilson and Dawn Marie. I'm going to give this one one and a half cheap shots out of five. Like I say, really difficult one to judge because of how it went and, and how much time they were given. But... Uh, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. The crowd was behind it. You got to see Tory Wilson. That's all you need, really, isn't it? So the next match was a straight-up cruiserweight contest. There's a lot of cruiserweight matches on this card. Um, and it is your standard sort of house show match. The crowd were really behind it. Um, well, behind Funaki, he had that little bit of something that... A lot of the guys at this level did not. Um, and he had a lot of charisma. Smackdown, number one announcer. Um, Funaki would go against Crash Holly. And he hadn't quite... Developed, well, he'd gone through his uh, hardcore phase, hadn't he? Um, and, and obviously the hardcore titles, I don't think a thing at this point anyway. Uh, so obviously he's transitioning into singles competition. Um, it's Funaki versus Crash. Um, okay match. Like I say, the crowd were behind it. More so behind Funaki than Crash. Um, not your standard cruiserweight contest. Um, there wasn't a lot of high flying. There was a lot of showing to the crowd. Um... With Crash pulling out a, a bandana from his trunks and tying it around his head and taking the mickey out of Funaki, who's from Japan, and uh, doing all these like Japanese, well, not even Japanese moves, they're just karate moves, uh, and look like Daniel LaRusso. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, they knew there wasn't going to be much of a reaction for them. Um, because there was either side of two, you know, matches that had storylines, um, with the next one being the Cruiserweight Championship, which is why I say, you know, it, it was, uh, it's the rebellions full of, uh, full of Cruiserweight matches, really. Um, yeah, I'd like say it was an okay match. Um, wasn't too interesting wasn't too high flying lots of rolling about um reversals of cradles and stuff like that and it would be that that would get the victory for funaki um crash would go for the roll through funaki would counter and crash just could not kick out and funaki would get the win um like i say not 
not bad. I don't like to say matches are really bad, um, but wasn't interested in this one. Gotta say, uh, like I say, the crowd were well behind Funaki, but I'm gonna give this one one cheap shot out of five. It's a shame because you got two really good performers here, but they obviously weren't given a lot of time to get things done. Um, so there you go. We move on to the next match. So on to the next match. We see Nidia walking through the backstage. Uh, she picks up a scent of some kind and uh, sniffs her own armpit, which is quite nice. Um, and then sniffs the security guard. She almost gags and walks around the corner to her beloved Jamie Noble, the cruiserweight champion, and says, the people in England stink. They've got really bad BO. Jamie Noble goes on a tyrant saying, look, these people are unkempt, they're unwashed, they, the women have hairs, hairy armpits and all that kind of stuff. Uh, standard, let's get the crowd against us kind of stuff. It's what we call cheap heat in the industry. And uh, you know, I've got to say, I do love Jamie Noble and, and Nydia. I, I just have a real soft spot for them. They are really good as a almost like a heelish comedy duo. Um, obviously, Jamie Noble is, a, is quite a different cruiserweight when it comes to it. Uh, more of a power cruiserweight rather than one that jumps around. Uh, that is covered by, by Rey Mysterio, obviously. And at this point, the cruiserweight is the cruiserweight championship and the cruiserweights are um, exclusive to SmackDown. Um, so, yes, we get the match. So it's Tajiri versus Rey Mysterio versus Jamie Noble with Nidia for the Cruiserweight Championship. And it is an elimination match. Um, so, obviously, it's whoever survives wins. Uh, obviously, leaving Jamie Noble at a huge disadvantage. Because if he gets pinned, he is out. And we, gar we are guaranteed... A new cruiserweight champion. Um, it, that's not how it stacks up. Uh, Tajiri comes out first. Jamie Noble and Nidia make their entrance next. Obviously, Rey Mysterio is the big marquee signing here for SmackDown and the cruiserweights. <coughs> so he comes out last. He gets jumped on his entrance. Uh, Jamie Noble realising that he's got to start out fast. Um, and then Tajiri jumping on Jamie Noble. They have a little bit of a fight. Uh, Tajiri chucks, uh, sorry, Jamie Noble dumps out uh, Tajiri into the, uh, onto the floor. And uh, Mysterio comes back in, manages to do the same with Jamie Noble. And then goes for a beautiful corkscrew plunger. Or to the outside, stuff that we don't really see at this point in WWE, which is what makes the Cruiserweights at this time so exciting. Um, and, uh, yeah, it wouldn't be long before Tajiri would be uh, tiger-bombed and pinned to, to be eliminated. It, it didn't take very long for that to happen. Leaving the... Main match, we would say. Well, let's, you know, let's chuck Tajiri in there. We need more bodies. Let's get him on a card. He's willing to go. Let's let's do a match. Ultimately, very good. Um, sad that he got eliminated quite so early because he already had a championship match at No Mercy only a couple of days before. Six days, in fact, before this pay-per-view. So, uh we move on now. It's Jamie Noble versus Rey Mysterio. Nidia gets involved a couple of times. Uh, Rey Mysterio does manage to get the 619 set up as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a bit of back and forth. Uh, gets the 619 set up. Nidia trips Rey Mysterio at this point. Um, all of these interferences did come at good times. They were really well timed. As well, much to the appreciation of me being a, a manager in professional wrestling at the moment. 
And um, yeah, that wouldn't be the end of it. Uh, Rey Mysterio would succumb to the Tiger Bomb, but would kick out. And uh, that would lead Nidia to interfere once more, leading Jamie Noble to manage to uh, get the roll up on Rey Mysterio. And much like the end of the um, Funaki crash match, um, it would be that kind of roll up. So they just sit over on them, um, and Nidia would hold Jamie Noble's hand to. Uh, Get the leverage pin. Um, so your cruiserweight champion is still Jamie Noble with a massive hand to Nidia. Nidia comes in with the title, celebrates, shows it to Rey Mysterio, gives him a slap and then goes to uh, pick Jamie Noble up, put the title around his waist. At that point, Rey Mysterio would do the dastardly thing of kicking them both in the back and hitting a 619, a double 619 which Cole inaccurately calculates as a 1,126,000 whatever. It, it didn't sound great. Anyway, <laughs> um, I think he called it a 1,200,218, which kind of makes sense, but, you know, whatever. Um, but, yeah, Cruiserweight match. Always good, always welcome on my list. Um, I really enjoyed this one. Uh, the interference didn't take away from the match either, which made it okay for me. And um, yeah, it would be uh, Jamie Noble gets the win. I'm going to give this one three and a half cheap shots out of five. Very good match. Uh, again, crowd behind it, crowd behind Rey Mysterio. Um, really building him up at this point, but obviously keeping the title on Jamie Noble because they know he gets the right reaction from the crowd. So why not? We move on to the next. So we've got some tag team action for you next. And um, <clears throat> before that, we have Chris Benoit, Kurt Angle, Kurt Angle's trying to convince Chris Benoit that he is the leader of their team. Um, Chris Benoit comes back and says, who won the titles for them? Who beat Kurt Angle on SmackDown? It was Chris Benoit. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're still arguing about that. Kurt Angle says, look, you know, the, the, our relationships like the UK and the US... And Chris Benoit says, I'm from Canada, bro. And so that's all the Commonwealth. It's exactly the same thing. Um, so, yeah. So they're a bit disjointed still. They're still having the uh, the competition between themselves. Um, and would that lead to something else? We don't know. But we get tag team match. We get a tag team match next. It is the thrown together team of Val Venus and Chuck Palumbo versus the thrown together team of Farouk and Reverend Devon. Uh, yeah, bit of a throwaway. This not not great. Not many tags. Uh, it starts off with a, a jump attack from Farouk and Devon. Uh, they get the upper hand. Palumbo does try and come back. Didn't see much of Val Venus in this match, to be honest with you. Uh, Plumbo would try and come back. Ultimately, uh, the numbers game would tell, and the referee not doing his job very well and getting people out of the ring uh, would lead to double teams. And, uh, yeah, it would be uh, Reverend Devon who would get the victory. As Plumbo would go outside to try and contact, make contact with Farouk. Farouk would hit him with a really hard right hand. Uh, that would lead to the roll up from Reverend Devon uh, with a handful of tights. And Devon and Farouk would come through this one. Again, like I say, a bit of a throwaway, a bit of a shame really that the tag division having introduced the new titles 
is not great <laughs> on SmackDown. It would get a lot better. They would be introducing more teams. And, uh, yeah, we we get a lot better as the years went on. But at this moment in time, it's not great. I'm going to give this one one cheap shot out of five. Again, hate to say that things are bad, so I'm not going to do that. They did what they could with the time they had and the chemistry they tried to build. Um, and it just didn't happen for them. We move on. So we go on to the next segment now. It is Los Guerreros talking about their championship match later on in the night uh, for the WWF. Uh, sorry, WWE Tag Team Championships. The championships won by Chris Benoit and Kurt Angle at No Mercy. Um, the Guerreros then talk about how great it will be when they win and go back to Mexico and have some traditional food with their grandma and uh, celebrate out of the out of the smelly country of the UK. Um, Again, cheap heat, um, but done in a way that only the Los Guerreros can do. So, we move on to the next match. It is Albert coming down to the ring with stock music number A. That didn't make any sense. Stock music A um, versus Rikishi with his uh, standard music in a kiss my ass match where... It is exactly what it says on the ass. It is the loser kissing the winner's ass. And this match doesn't happen very often because it's just a normal match with a stipulation at the end where the loser has to kiss the winner's ass. Um, obviously, Rikishi is known for backing that ass up, or in the UK, arse. Um, and this match... Yeah, I mean, it was a standard big man match. You can get some really good big man matches. This was not one of them. Um, they did what they could with with the material they were given. It was a kiss my ass match. It was there to make people go, yay, he's going to kiss his ass. Um, although, you know, only in wrestling would you get people cheering for that kind of stipulation. Um, so, yeah, the uh, the match... Uh, kicks off. They they're both you know going at each other, um, and uh, Rikishi reverses a, an Irish whip. Goes for the not the usual uh, bend over to do the back body drop. He he faces his ass into the direction of Albert, who then hightails it out of the ring in what was a very funny part of the match, and it was the most memorable part because really I've just sat and watched this match and can't remember anything else apart from the finish so we'll go straight for that um the crowd were behind this one I've got to say um because it was it was a special match and obviously Kishi's very popular um <clears throat> but it was always going to be a bit of a throwaway bonsai drop uh for the win for Kishi um dropping that ass onto the hairy ass of Albert anyway um, yeah so bonsai drop in memory of his cousin Yokozuna and um, yeah that would be uh, that would be that I'm going to give this match one cheap shot out of five we've got three of those in this card which is quite sad really um, but considering this pay-per-view went on about six days after a main pay-per-view. Um, yeah, you're probably not going to get much else out of that. And that was the SmackDown exclusive pay-per-view as well. So, <clears throat> after the match, Albert tries to hightail it. Uh, Rikishi does a mic check on his arse. And uh, says that there's one more thing that you've got to do. And that's got to, he's got to get to the ring and kiss Rikishi's ass. Um, then the referee gets on the um, the the mic, Jimmy Corderas, and says, 
you have the count to the count of ten to get back into the ring, otherwise you get suspended indefinitely without pay. Uh, obviously, the the commentators did a really good job there of uh, explaining why the referee had that kind of power. So Stephen McMahon making sure that nothing would go awry with this one, and um, so it didn't. Um, so yeah, we uh, Albert comes back into the ring, beats the count of ten. Gives Rikishi a low blow, gets back on the microphone, says, you're going to kiss my hairy ass. Rikishi gives him a low blow, backs the ass up, and a stink face to finish. Yeah, so there was more happening after the match than what happened during the match, uh, because we're not finished, because Rikishi says he's not going to leave Manchester without busting a move, and he wants to smack down announcers. But he didn't have the best SmackDown announcer, Funaki, out with him. Because he's the number one announcer. Obviously, he had a match earlier on in the night. Maybe he couldn't make it. Um, and uh, they invite Tony Chimmel into the ring as well. And they bust a move. It looks really shit. But we... I apologise for the swearing. Uh, it looks really bad. But we got it anyway. So... So we move on now to the next match, which is the WWE Tag Team Championship match between the current champions, having won the titles uh, inaugurally, I think that's a word, at uh, No Mercy on the 20th in uh, in the US. Uh, it is Chris Benoit and Kurt Angle. They are still having issues as a tag team. And that would play out throughout this contest. They are going against the uh, contenders, Los Guerreros. Um, been in the title picture since the uh, since the inauguration of the championships. Obviously, coming almost all the way through the uh, the tournament to get to the final. And there's been a bit of. Uh, back and forth between these two teams anyway uh, in the background of shows going back to No Mercy where Chavo is being beaten up by Kurt Angle uh, obviously they're teasing the dissension between uh, Chris Benoit and uh, Guerre the Guerreros having you know the long storied history of being good friends and uh, yeah really good match this one as you can as you can expect from these two teams um it does break down rather quickly i've got to say i think this this is early on in the smackdown tag title picture where things broke down quite easily um so basically towards the end of the match um chris benoit would hit a headbutt on a prone Eddie Guerrero uh, because Guerrero was pinning Kurt Angle and it was Chris Benoit who was legal in the in the match and uh, yeah it would lead up to the victory for the tag team champs uh, as uh, the referee would be knocked down and um, both would hit uh, either chair shots or title shots to each other and uh, get near falls. Um, and then it would be Eddie Guerrero who would uh, succumb to the uh, guillotine on the top rope from Chris Benoit. And that would lead him into the angle slam for the victory. And... Uh, yeah, really good show from these two. Uh, like I say, as you would expect from them. And there's no no surprises here. I'm going to give this one three and a half cheap shots out of five. Obviously, with this being a UK pay-per-view that's exclusive on UK pay-per-view. They were never going to go any further than doing sort of a house show. Just a more polished one. 
so that's what you got. It was a more polished house show tag team championship match. And it's very worthy of the rating that I've given it. Uh, after the match, it would be Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit who would be shoving each other and um, having more issues because Kurt Angle did run into Chris Benoit to knock Chavo Guerrero off the ring apron, etc, etc. And uh, the Guerreros would try and sneak in, steal the titles. Chris Benoit and Kurt Angle would work together again to get rid of the Guerreros and have their hands held high. Where will this feud slash partnership go? Who knows? We move on now to the main event. It is Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman in a handicap match against Edge, where Edge can win by pinning Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman, earlier on in the night, did complain to Stephanie McMahon, saying he didn't bring his trunks. Not that anybody wanted to see Paul Heyman in trunks, but Stephanie McMahon made him uh, just put up or shut up and uh, made him go out there anyway. He would spend most of the time on the outside of the ring, on the floor, in fact, uh, during this match. But we see Paul Heyman doing some really weak push-ups. Uh, as Brock Lesnar says, if you get pinned, I will snap you in half. Um, starting the lead up to... Uh, yeah, starting the lead up to Survivor Series uh, and what would occur there. Um, so we go on to the match. Uh, again, they do a really, really good job about uh, putting this match together because obviously you've got a non-wrestler in the match as part of the match. And uh, yeah, they keep Paul Heyman out of this one quite a lot they tease edge almost winning several times put and um, brock lesnar doing a really good job of, of making edge look like a credible contender obviously there's a huge difference in styles here and obviously brock lesnar is a lot stronger than edge but yeah brock lesnar bumps like a bitch in this one uh for edge so you know a couple of times he did get near falls um, and it would lead to uh, Paul Heyman obviously getting involved, uh, getting speared off the apron. The chair would eventually come into the ring for Brock Lesnar to use as the referee again was distracted. And that would lead Brock Lesnar into the F5 for the victory. As if it would go any, any different, any other way. Again, very credible match. I'm going to give this one three and a half cheap shots out of five as well. And very much deserved. Um, overall, fairly decent pay-per-view. Very watchable. Uh, it was never going to live up to the hype of No Mercy. And it's being sandwiched in between No Mercy and Survivor Series. Knowing that is going to be a history-making show. It was like I say, a glorified house show that you would see standard in the UK. Um, that being said, the crowd were hot. They absolutely ate this up, and I'm pretty sure that if I had the chance to actually go to this, which I probably could have done, but Manchester's fair, a fair way uh, for me, um, then it would have been awesome. And I would have been into it as much as the crowd are there. So, yeah, decent pay-per-view. Sandwiched in between two better pay-per-views. And there has been better pay-per-views during the year. But for a UK pay-per-view, and bearing in mind this was pro this was one of the last ones for nearly 20 years. Um, it shows how far wrestling has come. Anyway. You are the Cheap Shot Nation. I've been your host, Luke. This has been another retro review. This has been a rebellion in 2002, 2002, 2002. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll see you for Survivor Series coming up next. 
A real good one, that one is. I'll see you soon. Goodbye. Hiya!